I'm going to start by going back in time to the day that I was sentenced. Mr. Salam, do you have anything to say before we sentence you? Yes, I do. I'm not going to sit here at your table and watch you eat and call myself dinner. Sitting here at your table doesn't make me dinner, just like being here in America doesn't make me an American. Let us begin. Stress is the anger that is built up inside. Rage is the anger that is no longer built. Taking on a sucker that you're trying to kill. American free will doesn't mean you can kill. And take another person's life, you live, you live your life trife. I'm a skill builder, so on skills I do build. Creator giving knowledge to this wise black man. Soon to enhance my words across the land. I'm a smooth type of fellow, cool, calm, and mellow. I'm kind of laid back, but now I'm speaking so that you know. Got used and abused and even was put on the news without clues. They gave clues, selling out like fools. Now check this. Who did what and who did who in? Put in a situation that you don't know what to do in. Some brothers go wildin', we're not down with them. Who would have thought I'd have to lock in? I stand accused. Checking the scene from how the situation was. Instead of getting facts, the media made you blurred. Now the people don't know. All they see is the media. They never hear the blame because they're constantly deceiving us. The DA is dead wrong. This is her master plan. This case is not a case. It's just a crafted sham. Yo, instead of trying to get your name made, it's reconstructing the crime that really pays. Islam. La ilaha illallah, being supreme over Satan, but no man is a law. Yes, I'm a science dropper on the righteous path, so why the hell could I take a rapist path? Think about that, and then think about this. All my friends, it was me they dissed, they're dismissed. Because I don't really need any friends like that. Like when I really needed you, where were you at? I'm not dissing them all, but the sum that I called, they wouldn't diss me. Like I was an inch small, like a rat. A mouse, not even the man, wrongly accused, like the knife's in my hand. How does it look, me clocked and I'm shook, but like Matlock, soon the accused gets off the hook. It's real when she, re when she remembers and says, damn, the cops did you in, I stand accused. The people stop, this racial disperse, say, yo, you seen that kid Benson? He's in a hearse. And so we take it to the Benson hearse fields, why it's got bulletproof vests and we got no kinds of shields. How does it look they killed the black man being black? It's time to take a stand. In our situation, you saw our faces clear, but not mine's, not because of fear. It's because the black race was disgraced and for the Muslims. They must have felt shame, but I'm not to blame with the words you bought. The media took the words, the papers, the ones the cops distorted. I told the cops truth like this and then boom, they were smacking my man Corey Wise in the next room. Now I know why the rosters can't stand the Bobby line. They never help, they just babble on. I used to think the people and cops were cool, but who protects us from you? I stand accused. I was told that the people in the audience were silently clapping and swaying to the mysterious beat that wasn't playing. But as you can imagine, the judge threw the book at me. I was 16 at the time. They convicted me. And the only thing that I can do in, in, in for my defense was to stand up and say something. And those words were the words that came out. Part of it, the introduction, had been uh, put together through a speech that I read, Malcolm X had given, and the rest were words that I had somehow mysteriously uh, been a vessel to deliver. You know, And it's wild because when you think about time and how things are connected, here I was talking about things and saying that soon I'm gonna be let free of this atrocity. It took 13 years. 13 for most folks is an unlucky number. For me, it became my return to society card. I, I returned to society after spending time in prison and I still didn't understand how I got there. 
when I got sentenced, they said they made a mistake. I think this was maybe the only time the city ever said they made a mistake with regards to my case. The mistake they said they made was they sent me to Rikers Island by mistake, and I was supposed to go to Spofford, back to Spofford. There are no mistakes. But while I was on Rikers Island, I was threatened. They put me in involuntary protective custody because Corey Wise had already been there and had already been beat up numerous times. I think they were trying to figure out how could they see if something can happen to me. But when they sent me back to Rikers Island and then they, further, they sent me upstate, I was in a place called Harlem Valley for about five years. And then after Harlem Valley, they shaved my hair. I used to have a flat top. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, uh, happy birthday. And for my 21st birthday, they shipped me to a place called Clinton Danamora. Seeing Clinton is the worst visual picture of a haunted house I had ever seen in my life. But up there were people who were former members of the Black Panther Party, people who were part of the Black Liberation Army, people who when I got there, they knew who I was before I got there. And I'm walking around the yard, and somebody walked up to me and said, hey, uh, you Yusef Salam? I said, yeah. What's up? They said, man, come over here with us. You can't be walking around this yard by yourself. I was completely blown away. But when I got there, I had been given a prison number. This was in 1995. My prison number was 95A1113. I'll never forget it. Most inmates, most formerly incarcerated people would never forget their number. They're made to say their number over and over again. I had no idea what this number meant. I just thought this was my number. And then one of the old timers said, your number signifies the time that you came to this facility. So that was 1995. I turned 21 in February of that year. A meant the first part of the year. And 1113 meant that I was the 1,000th, 113th person to enter the door. And it was February 27th. Prison, I just have to maybe pause for a second because this is my first time coming back to prison. You know, I commend you for what you're doing here. This is tremendous. I would have never imagined that I would be here in prison enjoying myself. I mean, this is, this. listen, when I get home, I, I'm meant to take my uh, devices in here. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, Facebook. I'm all over social networks. And I'm meant to be tweeting while I was in here and doing some kind of interactions, but you can't bring any devices in. So I, I reminded myself that as soon as I get home, I'm gonna write, I had the most amazing time today. I went back to prison. <laughs> but you know, in prison, prison did some, did, it did some very interesting things to me. It was, perhaps one of the most peaceful times that I can ever imagine, which is strange. But in prison, I remember coming across a piece of poetry that kind of helped me get through this difficult time. And that piece of poetry was very succinct, and it simply said, prison life in many ways can be likened to the womb. If the life inside becomes stillborn, the womb becomes the tomb. An officer came to me one day, and he said to me, who are you? And I kind of looked very puzzled, and 
was like, this guy was under a rock or something. I couldn't understand why he was asking me who I was because my face had been in every single newspaper. They had written over 400 articles before the trial had even started within the first few weeks of the incident. And I said, I'm Yusuf Salam, the guy that they accused of raping the Central Park jogger. He said, I know who you are, but who is Yusuf Salam? Why are you here? And it was one of those kind of Matrix Morpheus kind of Neo moments where I was like, why, why am I here? Why was this chosen for me? I didn't volunteer to go to prison. I was going to LaGuardia High School. I got kicked out of LaGuardia High School because somebody told on me because I had a weapon. Never carry weapons. But I had a weapon because it was a sense of false security. I was going to LaGuardia High School, and there was a group back in 1989 called the Decepticons. When I tell people about this group, they swear I'm making this story up. But I can tell by the audience, a lot of you folks know exactly who the Decepticons are and the Decepticons and all of that other stuff. This is not TV. This is real life. And so I used to carry a, a knife on me. Never had to pull this knife out, I just carried it, a false sense of protection. And somebody said, he has a knife. And he said, you gotta go. And so I went. And they brought that up at my trial. They said he was carrying a knife. Because Corey Wise had made a false statement and said the Central Park jogger had got cut up. And they were trying to paint the picture to make the charges stick. And that picture was that this woman had been beaten and she was not expected to live and she had been raped, but she had no cut marks on her. Actually, none of the accused had any blood on them or dirt under their fingernails or anything. I mean, you guys already know the story though. But me trying to figure out why I was there was the, was the weirdest thing. And then I realized, you don't get things placed on you more than you can bear. This prison is different. This prison is very different. But when I was in Harlem Valley, I got my, um, my associate's degree. And then I started going for more credits to get my bachelor's degree. Then they took prison out of, I mean, then they took education out of the prison industrial complex. And it wasn't until I started reading Malcolm X and realizing what he was saying in some of his words, simple things like, you know, if you were a street pharmacist and you were a legal pharmacist, the only difference is education. And I'm putting it all together and I'm realizing that when you get educated, you have more options. You don't have to say, I went to go get the job and they told me they weren't hiring today. And so then I tell my family I tried and then you leave, and then you hit the man in the head that looks like me because I have a suit on, and I happen to drive, <laughs> you know. And you look at that as your opportunity and your meal ticket. But education causes you to say, I have more options than one. And so while in prison, I got my education. And then at some point, I said, OK, when I come home, how am I going to put this all together? And it was through that moment I realized something. I was born into a Muslim family. I didn't know anything about Islam until I came to prison. But what I found out was that children in Islam are usually born without a name. And on my birth certificate, true to form, it says baby, so it says boy Salam. That's my first birth certificate. <laughs> and my, my parents named me, OK, it's a sentence, Yusef Idris Fahadil Abdus Salam. And you know, in New York back in the 80s, people would say, Joseph? And I would say, yes, that's me, OK. I guess they can't pronounce Yusef, but sounds kind of close enough, you know. But while I was in prison, I'm trying now to figure out who am I? 
that one question sent me on a journey. And I found out who I was. Yusuf means God will increase. Idris is the equivalent of the prophet Enoch in the Bible. And Enoch was known as the first teacher. Fa'adil means with honor. And salam means peace. And when you put it all together, you have God will increase the teacher with honorable peace. And I said, wow, this is too much for me. You know, but I was ready to kind of take it in, but I was still in prison. And I started reading scripture, and I started reading about a guy named Joseph in the Bible. And I said, wow, this guy, uh, my story sounds like his story. Started reading about Yusuf in the Quran. I said, my story sounds like their story. I mean, it's the same person. A guy goes to prison for a crime he doesn't commit. That crime is rape. The best thing about the story was that he was freed while he was in prison. I had tremendous hope. I said, oh, man, it's been a day. I'm going to come out of here tomorrow. <laughs> and then two days went by, and then months and years. And I came home to parole. And even while I was on parole, I was trying to figure things out. And one of the things that helped me was Nelson Mandela. Here's a man who went to prison, did way more time than me. And he was known to have said, to be angry and bitter is like drinking poison and expecting your enemy to die. And I'm saying to myself, you know, who hasn't had a bad day? Who hasn't gone to a grocery store, a, a shopping area, somewhere, been on the highway and somebody just pissed you off. They call it road rage if you're on the highway. But who hasn't had these bad days? Those experiences cause me to remember and to take, always take a step back. Because there was this one story um, I believe Stephen Covey was mentioning. As you can see, I kinda, I've been doing some self-help stuff. <laughs> And I'm listening to Stephen Covey, and Stephen Covey, he's talking about this time where he was on a train, and it was kind of nice and quiet, and then all of a sudden, a, a guy gets on the train with his children, and the children are very rambunctious and disrupting the, the atmosphere and the energy on the train. And you know, Stephen Covey kind of looked up and said, well, maybe I should say something to this guy. So he kind of went over and said, uh, do you think it's possible that you can uh, quiet down your children? They're kind of disrupting everyone. And the guy looked up and said, uh, I guess I should say something. We just came from the hospital, and their mother just passed away. I guess they don't know how to take it. That changes everything. When I'm on the highway and someone cuts me off, they could be trying to go to the hospital to save somebody in the car. They might not be a bad person just by cutting me off and flipping me the bird. I twist things a little bit, you know, just, you know, I don't want to go back here. <laughs> but those types of things helped me. And it was through those things that I learned that you have to let go in order to move forward. If I remain here, like, well, I still refuse to wear a Donald Trump suit. That's a different story, though. When I was uh, going through this whole ordeal, Donald Trump took out those full-page ads and called for the reinstatement of the death penalty, specifically for my case. I couldn't help but think that had this been the 1950s, I would have been just like Emmett Till. I mean, my story was a story that they were trying to, as you can see with these letters, they were trying to get someone from the darker places in society to kick in my door, drag us out of our houses, and hang us from trees in Central Park. That would have been the type of justice that we would have received. This is my life. 
Self-help was my path to redemption. Self-help, not just because of the genre of self-help, but self-help from the perspective of helping myself. I educated myself enough, and if you've seen my latest Facebook post, I educated myself enough that I broke my iPad. Screen was shattered. I cleared away the glass, put a new case, put a new glass on there, and my iPad is brand new again. I taught myself how to do these things. It caused me, because of my education and because of my scholastics, when I was working in my mother's office when I came home, someone walked by her, my, the, the office space that I was in and he saw all of these computer books on the wall. And he said, who's reading this stuff? My mother said, my son, and he needs a job. She was plugging it, she was trying to help me. She was trying to help me. And uh, the lady says, I know the best place that he can work. I got an interview at New York Presbyterian Hospital the number one hospital in New York City. And I got hired. And I worked there for seven years. And then I got a call from another hospital in Long Island to do the same job that I was doing at Presbyterian, but they would pay me more money. And I said, well, how much more? They said, how much do you need? So let me back up a second before I end this. I have three daughters. I had three daughters. I still have three daughters, but I had three daughters. And then I met my lady, and she had two boys and a girl. That was the Brady Bunch. But you know, I had three daughters. And so I tried for a boy. <laughs> then I had four daughters. <laughs> And I said, you know what, let me try again. <laughs> then I had five daughters. <laughs> it went from the Brady Bunch to eight is enough. <laughs> and I was like, maybe the last time is the charm. I have six biological daughters. <laughs> My house is never a dull moment. So when they asked me how much did I need, I had never heard that before in my life. It was the best thing that I had. I mean, it was like, I threw a fictitious number out there. I had never made this much money before in my life. It was so fictitious that I was like, Put it out there. And they said, uh, okay, we could pay you $50 less. I gave New York Presbyterian my pink slip. I've been out on the island for the past two years. You know, I call it proper positioning, because if you position yourself for success, when you knock on the door or when someone opens the door, you will be ready. And for me, I didn't think about failure. I thought about the possibility of not having to struggle. I had heard too many stories about how people got to prison. Most people that I met, they said to themselves, well, you know, I'm in here because my man, uh, my man Raheem was the getaway driver and I needed my man Bobo. And I said, no, nah, man, you're in here because you needed to pause for a second. And if you ever get an opportunity to get back, come back better. Don't come back with a better 
crime plan. Come back better. We need to be more productive citizens in society. There's, there's a lot that needs to happen with regards to that. But I took the first step in something that could have been disastrous. When I met Ken Burns and he made the film, The Central Park Five, you know, Ken Burns said, uh, you know, we thought you were guilty. And I kind of was like, well, you know, a lot of people did, but I'm happy you said the truth. Because, you know, a lot of people, I meet them, they're like, we always thought you guys were innocent. <laughs> and, you know, Ken Burns, he said to me, you know, we were talking and we had been on this whirlwind of a movie tour. They thought the film was just going to show up in a few places and that was going to be it. This film gave us our lives back. We were in California, walking the red carpet. I saw some stars. I actually put some shades on. I had to play the part. Don't judge me. <laughs> but we were out there and I was talking to him and I said, you know, it's a conspiracy what happens in the communities that we come from. And I said, you know, I said they got books written about this stuff, The Conspiracy to Destroy the Black Boys, Volume 1, 2, and 3. And they even have The Conspiracy to Destroy the Black Girls. And Ken Burns said, there is no conspiracy. And, you know, me and Ken was rocking up until that point. And I kind of said, ooh, I don't know, mm, what is he talking about? I was confused. But what he said next changed everything. It's all part of the plan. We call it a conspiracy because we can't wrap our minds around sometimes the devious nature of things. But we need to realize also that we can rise above it and become our own revolutionaries. So I leave you with this. The revolution will not be televised. I can remember when that statement made me sad inside. Too young to be in it. Now I couldn't even see it? Why? Why couldn't the revolution be televised? The last poets, Gil Scott Heron, as I grew up, I began to see. They left theirs. And I, too, wanted to leave a mark on history. A man in half, and I wanted to bask in that task that set men free. But a revolution, the revolution, is where I knew I had to be. The revolution will not be televised. They didn't want to display the victory of those quote unquote lesser men. The revolution will not be televised. Smile, I know, because I am the revolution. Thanks. <laughs>